Hello, everybody. Welcome to Stages Podcast. This is the podcast that bridges the generational gap across the board. And today we have a very special episode. I am joined with two millennials and one from the silent generation, and I am the baby boomer. I'm Mary. And We have joining, of course, always, my amazing podcast partner, Lorena. Hi, I'm Lorena. Lorena. I'm a millennial. (laughs) And we also have Zach, our producer, who's a co-millennial. That's me. Yeah. (laughs) That's me. I co-pilot the millennial part of this ship. What? what? (laughs) What's up? And today, we have a very special world-renowned broadcaster, (laughs) talk radio host of going on 46 years, in his 46th year of broadcasting. Um, Here in DFW, we have Norm Hitchkiss, which is so exciting. (laughs) You you, you forgot to mention the most important part. I'm the better one quarter of this relationship. (laughs) Why only a quarter? Well, she's three quarters, <laughs> at least. <laughs> That's a good husband, as all women are. You know, we got a lot to bring to the table. Exactly right. And and Zach, we bada men bada bada must boom. quickly find our level in these relationships. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's true. It's true. So we are it's so some- graced to have norm here on the show it is so cool Mm -hmm. and norm is from the silent generation which i did a little bee-boo-bop research on and uh on familysearch.org they say the term silent generation was first documented in a 1951 time magazine article which claimed that the most startling fact about this generation was its silence By comparison with the flaming youth of their fathers and mothers, today's younger generation is still a small flame. But that was in 1951. And I'd say since then, you have (laughs) blossomed to be prolific at being not silent. Speaking your truth. my, (laughs) My silent generation has as become... An entire lifetime of talking. Uh, that's that's what I do for a living. I've talked for a living now for 46 years, continuously on the air doing sports in Dallas. Wow. That is a it's very long amazing. time. That's amazing. I mean, that's like the longest in the longest run in the United States. Yeah, in a major market in the United States, the longest yeah. continuous run is me. Uh, wow. Now, That's how amazing. How long it goes on, I don't know. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool. It's really cool. Got another 46 at least, I'd say. At least. No, <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> I, I'm thinking, Norm. Now it, with... Go ahead, Lorena. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. So... I was thinking, like, Norm, and during that time, I'm sure you have, like, some amazing stories, like, amazing interviews. You've interviewed countless people. So what is, like, one of your favorite stories from this time? Oh, my goodness. I, I could I could list off 10 or 15 of them. Um, well, I don't know if people remember Howard Cosell, but he was a giant in our industry. Well, let's ask our millennials if they know who he is. Uh, I don't know who he is, but I'm looking him up. (laughs) Never heard of him. him Guys, they're looking him up. This is what we're (laughs) talking about. Bridging the generational gap. Here we go. Well, Howard Cosell was a giant in our industry. He he did Monday Night Football. He did all sorts of things. He just became a massive figure. And I worked for about a year to try to get him as a guest. And finally he agreed and he came on and he did an hour. An hour. That was just, and I sat there. He could be very, very difficult at times. He could be very critical at times. And I sat there for an entire hour thinking to myself, 
please, please don't screw up and, and have him turn into a critic. Uh, my, maybe my favorite story on the air is we, we do remotes that is broadcast from other locations other than the studio. And in, this was maybe the late 80s or early 90s. Understand that radio stations, um, they don't care where they get money from, okay? They just want to get money. Yeah. So a salesperson <laughs> sold a remote at a Texaco Mart. You know, a little gas station, one of these little stations. But it wasn't a big place like you have now with 15 or 20 pumps. This place had like like four gas pumps. And it was a tiny place. Was it still back in the day where they would clean your windows and check your oil? <laughs> Not that far back. Okay. <laughs> so I get there and I look at my engineer and there's no room inside the Texaco mark to set up the table to do the broadcast. So we decide we're going to set up outside. Major mistake. Uh, we're at the corner of um, Northwest Highway and Skillman, I believe, at the mm -hmm. corner in the morning with all sorts of traffic news, traffic sounds going on. Then at about quarter to seven, the skies start to darken and they get darker and darker. And I'm sitting outside with headsets on and all this electrical stuff around me. And I'm thinking, oh, no, is this where I die? I die at a Texaco mark trying to do a broadcast. <laughs> and finally, the rain erupts while I'm on the air and I'm getting just drowned in this heavy rain. I've got no notes. My notepad is gone. So we go to a break and I tell my my buddy at the station, Dan Bennett, I'm coming in. I don't know how you fill the next 20 or 25 minutes until I get there. But, oh my God. I got to get out of the train storm. And I came in, I looked like a drowned rat, and then I did the rest of the show. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That's ridiculous. That's some determination. <laughs> right? Like, how that old were you? Epic. Well, before... Before I met Mary, Mary and I, as you all know, love to travel. We just cherish traveling. Well, I I love traveling too, and I did at times solo traveling. I would just go, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I I did a talk show host in the seventies, and it, that's where I started in the seventies for public radio, and we would try to do the show from wherever I was. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that meant doing an hour show from a payphone outside. <laughs> there were some, there were some real <laughs> crazy moments back then. Um, oh my god! Yeah, gosh. like Lorena wow. said, from that a payphone termination from a payphone. Payphone, standing there with the old yeah. the old payphone, <laughs> standing there holding this. And my pad is on, you know, the payphone said that little shelf. So I had the pad there mm -hmm. and I'm I'm holding this with my left hand because I'm I'm writing little notes to myself with my right hand. Yeah, this is a fun industry. Wow. And like you've seen such change. I'm really curious to know like so like broadcast and radio. I know for the music industry. I've been to some radio conferences where, you know, the older people that are still in radio with music are like real disgruntled about Spotify, like real <laughs> pissed about it. <laughs> but for you with talk radio, like, I mean, just during this year, like, obviously my dad, you are his whole, like, the ticket is his life. And I think any man interested in sports in the DFW Metroplex or woman, but a lot of men, I mean, that's like, they're, it's like some people like need to read the Bible every day, but these men got to listen to the ticket. Like that's it <laughs> <laughs> for my dad. And also now sports my, hu Mecca. my husband <laughs> from Ireland, like 
the ticket, you're single handedly teaching him everything he knows about American sports, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but well, what do you please. think of like podcasting and the way things have changed? And I mean, in a way, the ticket has really prevailed through all the changes of technology. Like, I don't know. What are your thoughts yeah. on what that all is well, now? When the industry started way, way, way back, and as you said, I'm silent generation. I'm a World War II baby. Yeah. Um, uh, back then, your listeners, they weren't well informed. Mm. You were often, you or the newspaper, were often their two sources of information. So if you could keep ahead of the game by watching the games, by taking notes, things like that, mm -hmm. you were great. Now, the internet hits. Thank you to Al Gore for inventing that. Um, uh, the internet hits. All of a sudden, the listening audience is smarter than you are. I'm serious. Wow. You're always talking to an audience where some people are smarter than you are about a subject. And it is not unusual at all for us to finish a segment on the air now and I'll go to my computer during the break, and there are five people saying, no, no, you got that wrong. <laughs> you know, it was a third round pick. Oh, and my gosh. And things like that. And wow. I mean, yes, the, the listening audience now is so smart mm -hmm. that if you, don't, if you don't do your homework, you can sound like a real fool on the air. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> I love hearing I like that totally is like I know for me with music a big fear sometimes I have about putting stuff out there cuz there's always somebody that's better that knows more that can scrutinize. And I didn't even I've never even like thought of that for y'all with like sports like of course you're go you're getting that same even you who's like father of sports radio. <laughs> Is getting people being like, Norm, you better check yourself. I'm like, that's crazy. Yep, exactly. No, no, that that oh. happens regularly in in this business Jesus. now. And you gotta stay, you gotta stay really up on things. I, when I started, well, when I started, there were virtually no sports talk jobs in this city. Wow. There was a, a job at KRLD. Mm -hmm doing sports talk and and there was a job at KRLD and there was a job at WFAA. Now, okay. these aren't all day jobs. They had one show for a couple of hours and that's all that was available. And I I wanted I wanted to be a sports talk host so badly. And <laughs> WFAA had they they had <clears throat> dismissed their talk show host. So wow, I got a tape to them quickly because I was already doing a show on public radio. And they they hired somebody else. And I thought, but I'm better than him. <laughs> and and then <laughs> they, fired him, they fired him in about six months. So I thought, here it is. So I quick called him again. And they hired somebody else. And I thought, oh. I'm better than him. And then they, they did it again. They fired him. And then they fired another guy. And oh. I thought, all these wow. people are getting this job I want. And finally, after I'd gone to, to New York to work for Newsweek and the, the Los Angeles to work for KABC-TV, finally WFA called and the guys, but the guy I'd been applying to all these years said, "Do you want to come home?" <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy, but the, it was so competitive back then. Now, oh my heavens! Everybody <laughs> and his dog has a sports talk show. Um, and and by the way, not not to offend you all. But then there's podcasting, which is a whole mm -hmm. new area yeah. mm -hmm. that people can say, well, 
I, I didn't get to listen to them today, but I can listen to them anytime. I just have to punch it up on what? Uh, Apple. Apple. Yeah, okay. Apple, Apple, Spotify. Spotify. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks for filling me in on this tech stuff. You got it. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. <laughs> But, uh, yeah. Well, it really is amazing, Norm, that, that even with all of that, you've still managed to hold such a large part of the market share, you know, with the ticket and just with the personalities that you have on there. But I have a question. I'm, I'm curious about this. I, just, just being honest, I'm, I'm not really a sports guy. I mean, I really appreciate the work that you do in particular, but I, I'm just curious your perspective as somebody who has been a sort of commentator about sports social like a social commentator about this phenom this multi-billion dollar phenomenon in the united states mm -hmm. what is it about sports that has captured the hearts of so many people across america across the entire world why is it the giant industry that it is i think all of us as human beings we like things okay we like music mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. music captures the hearts of loads of people in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say travel, but a lot of people don't get to travel with regularity. Politics captures the hearts and the minds of a lot of people. And with sports, I just, Zach, I love the competition. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, there'll be, some Saturdays where Mary's doing qigong or yoga or, or something, okay? <laughs> and, and I'm in the, the room with the TV on. And I'll flip around the channels, and I'll stop and watch women's softball. I'll stop and watch hmm. track and field. Hmm. I, I'll stop and watch. I love horse racing. But the, the competition... It's just incredible to watch human beings giving everything they've got. Now, some of them don't have much to give, but but they're just all out there competing like crazy. You see some of these 50 and over softball leagues, they're maniacs. They just <laughs> love the competition, and I love the competition. And I think the key, Zach, is people who love to watch and love competition. Then you blend in the our team factor. You know, the Cowboys are mm -hmm. our team. Mm -hmm. the, the Mavs and the Stars and the Rangers. Mm -hmm. And that that further cements that relationship. Mm -hmm. But it's it is it is a phenomenon. And I understand how all three of you right now are sitting here listening to me and feel you may be on the outside of this phenomenon. And I understand that. I fully understand it. Um, hmm. There are lots of people who don't care at all. They love when a Cowboys <laughs> game because there's no traffic on the roads. Everybody's home watching the Cowboy game. Cowboy games are <laughs> terrible for home burglars. Home burglars can't count on breaking into anybody's house while the Cowboys are playing because there's always <laughs> lots of people in there. Um, right. You know, and, but it, it, it is a phenomenon for certain. And can I just say, like, um, like, I'm not a huge sports person either, but what I love and I think what has kept Norm so in the mainstream for, you know, 47 years now is he brings a human element to it. So even if you don't follow mm -hmm. sports, mm -hmm. he brings that human side. He tells you about the person and that can interest even a person that's not a sports fan. I have always loved finding way off the beaten path stories. I have interviewed mm -hmm. the, the four or five time cherry pit spitting champion of America. Uh, I interviewed a guy who with his partner had won the Grease zucchini toss competition in, in New Hampshire. And when I asked if, if he ate zucchini, he said to me, you've got to eat them to understand them. <laughs> But, 
They're, they're, they're wonderful. Wow. They're wonderful moments. I've, I've told Mary this story that um, this is this is back 25 years or more. Four men had set out to climb Mount Everest without oxygen and without a Sherpa guide. It had never, ever been done. Four guys set out, and they got to about, I'm going to say, it's 22, 24,000 feet, and one guy got sick and said, I've got to go back to base camp, which he did. They went a little further, and another guy said, I, I can't do this. It, it, I just can't do it. And he went back to base camp. So two guys soldier on, and I had those two guys on the air. And they get to within one day's climb of the peak of Mount Everest. Their whole life is climbers right here. And they decide to rest because the weather was going to be good. They decide to rest for a while. And one of the guys tells this story. and He gets up and he looks outside the tent at the top of Mount Everest and sees a group of men in purple robes beckoning him to come forward. And he, and he woke up his friend, and he said, I, I can't go with you. If I go with you, I think this means I've been called to my death. And he waited for him. And the other guy went along and climbed it himself, spent, I don't know, 15, 30 minutes up there and came back down. And the stories these guys had, they were on for an hour together. And one of them had lost the first joint of a couple of fingers to frostbite. Oh. And it was, they, they, they wow. really suffered from this. Yeah. They, they'd wow. suffered. So at yeah. the end of this, all this, I said to them, would you do this again? And one guy said to the other guy, what do you think, Ed? Yes. <laughs> and I thought, that's a whole different breed of yeah. human being does something like this. Wow. It, right? Wow. It's crazy. It's just like, but they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, everywhere. Do you watch IndyCar racing at all? Me? I, I can't I, say that I do. I, okay. I'll only well, briefly. <laughs> okay. Well, when I'm in the car with Zach hmm. and he starts getting to 80 miles an hour, I get, I get nervous. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I get nervous. Uh, I, he's a good driver now, but I, I still, well, I'll look over the speedometer and I'll think, oh my God, we're going 80 miles an hour. <laughs> well, these guys in these Indy cars go 225, 230 miles an hour. Yeah. And, and that the world is just a blur to them. They, mm -hmm. they start at one o'clock and they start turning left for about three hours. <laughs> and they just, <laughs> and I'm thinking, I could never do that. Yeah. But some people, that's their dream. Yeah. That's, I feel like, like I know what you say is that you love competition. That's what you love about it. But what I hear <laughs> is that, you love people's passion for competition. It's like you are so passionate about people's passion for competition, which has had such an amazing, like such a long career of just like, you're so engaging because you yourself, it's just born out of such passion for the passion of sport, which is, I totally, I, I feel that. It's awesome. It is amazing. Well, you, you, you run across people years and years, 50 years ago, and he is, I'm sure, since long dead. It was 40, 48 years ago, I was at Newsweek. And I went out to, out to Belmont to do a piece on horse racing. And I encountered a guy named Coleman who... He didn't have any high school education. Come on, back then, no. The, the, the children of the First World War and the Depression, they, a lot of them got no education at all. Coleman's education came at the racetrack. 
And he, what he did was he took care of horses. He shoveled out their stalls. He gave them water and hay and walked them when they needed to. But he had this incredible wisdom, incredible wisdom. So we're standing in the, the barn one day and a horse walks by. Good looking horse, I'm telling you. And I said, Coleman, that's a good looking horse. And he said to me, yeah, but that one was born with a whole lot of stop in him. <laughs> and and I, I, asked, I asked him about, about uh, stuff that goes on, um, cheating. And Coleman said, you got to remember at the racetrack, all shut eyes ain't sleeping. And all goodbyes ain't gone. <laughs> I thought, wow. I, he was just great. And wow. I, one, one more quick story about horse racing. I was in yeah. Los Angeles working for ABC. <laughs> and I talked to this trainer, good trainer at Santa Anita. Good trainer, had nice horses. And he told me a story about he had this horse that he couldn't figure out why this horse wasn't wasn't running well. All of a sudden, she was a mare. She had performed poorly. Had the vet come in. Vet can't find anything. So there were rumors about this woman who was a horse whisperer. Now, I know that's the joke of the time. Dog whisperer, horse whisperer, everything. So he called her. I love that. I know. He said he called her. (laughs) She came to the barn and she said, okay, can you please take me into the stall and close the door and just shut me in there with the horse for a while? He said, okay. So he closes the door and he hears her talking every once in a while. And their horse, the horse is in there. With this woman, 30, 45 minutes. And she comes out and she said, I think she's got an ulcer. And he said, what? He said, I think she's got an ulcer. So he called back and had tests run and she had an ulcer. Oh, nice. Yeah. And this woman... For a few years, she wasn't, now she wasn't, the vets didn't like her, all that people didn't like her, but for a few years at Santa Anita, when, when trainers encountered problems like this, they would very quietly call this woman in. They didn't want her coming in with everybody in the bars, very quietly call her in. And she would come out of the, 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 the stall and say, his left knee hurts. And and they'd say, what? His left knee hurts. And they would go and have a lot of x-rays done, and the horse would have like a hairline fracture up by the knee. And stuff like that. Wow. That just, I love this business, and I love yes. running across stories like that. Right. That's that amazing. is amazing. Yeah. Oof. I love that. And I feel like, too, like that kind of like spiritual energy work healer, something I'm very into. But my dad, for instance, wouldn't be that into. (laughs) But through the ticket and you bridging that gap of like this, your Mm. interest in people and the differences and these other journeys, you're like bring it to an audience that might otherwise in a different circumstance be like, oh, that's all BS. But then when Norm Hitchkiss comes in with that kind of a story is like, it's all possible. <laughs> so that's cool. right. He's bridging that gap. That's right, Lorena. Bridging that <laughs> gap for well, us all. All us DFWNs. <laughs> well, there's an... The games can be boring to you all. I understand that. You don't want to sit and watch something for three hours or three and a half hours or God help baseball longer than that. Um, God help baseball. But but I find a fascination to the games Mm -hmm. because 
In addition to stars that fascinate me, I, I really, really honestly mean that. It's not the stars. It's the people trying to hang on to careers, mm -hmm. hang on to lives. The people who, since they were 11 years old, hope to be a ball player. And at 33 years old, they're just clinging to a career, fighting for it every day. Those types fascinate me mm -hmm. because they know mm. it's coming to an end. And how are they going to deal with it when it comes to an end? Yeah. 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 So cool. So wow. cool. And yeah. speaking to coming to an end. That's such a... <laughs> wow. We hate to end our time because this is amazing. I know. I Maybe was thinking... Join us again. We might have to do like a, just a regular norm, like story time with Norm every like month or yeah. two. This is really great. And, and I feel like just such yeah. a wealth of advice and experience right. and just everything yeah. all exactly. in one. Exactly. Like we haven't even we haven't even scratched the surface yet. We haven't even I mean, the yeah, surface we haven't, is we haven't even scratched it. Just looking at it. <laughs> yeah, we're just looking at it. <laughs> so what do you say? You want to come back on and do story time with sure. Norm sometime? I, I'm happy to come back on. Thank <laughs> you for asking me. Um, I, I have to say. That I, can you snap with us, Norm? I can snap with you. Oh. I have to say, I really like you guys, but I love her. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Wow. Well, thanks again for for coming on the show today, Norm. You are our you are such a great guest. Uh, and I, I hope that this can really help jumpstart your career now that you've been on uh, something <laughs> like Stages I'm, Podcast. I'm just like one of those 33-year-old ball players trying to hang on, but I'm trying to do it at 76. Uh, we'll, we'll put his email in the show notes, guys. So Any sponsors? Well, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay, thanks for being on. Oh, yeah. thank you. Um, thank you, Norm. This is a wrap, guys. This is an amazing um, time that we had, and we'll see you next week on stage. Guys.